from the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so, in far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren, I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from external things, there's the daily pressure of me, of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? find it interesting that as Paul describes the adversities he endured spreading the gospel, I find it interesting that not only does he include on the list, but he concludes the list with these words. He says, besides everything else, I face daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? Think about that. As he talks about shipwrecks and beatings among his adversities, on that list he would include his concern for his brothers and sisters who struggled in their faith. Isn't that remarkable? I think it says something to us, brothers and sisters, about the depth of Paul's love for his brothers and sisters. When he thought about them struggling spiritually, that was a matter that was, that was a matter of intense concern to him. That wasn't a trivial or a casual thing. It, it was a big thing right up there with, with, with beatings and shipwreck and things like that. Here's the thing that you and I need to know. It is to exactly that same measure of love that 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 Christ calls every disciple who follows him. So I'm going in my Bible to Galatians. I hope you'll go there too. In Galatians chapter 6, look down at verse number 1. This is Galatians 6 verse 1. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. It only makes sense that that would be so because we are a spiritual family. Holy Spirit uses family language to describe us all the time. We are brothers and sisters. We use that language with each other. We are are brethren. The Holy Spirit says we are are God's household. He He is our father. We are his children. We are family. And so it only makes sense that when a family member falls into into spiritual catastrophe, we care about that, doesn't it? That we would care deeply about that and be willing to do whatever could be done to rescue them, right? I didn't hear an amen. Amen. Are you with me today? We got a brother and sister in sin. We need to be willing to do whatever we can do to rescue them. Anything, right? Still with me? Because I want to see if you're with me when we get done with this verse. Because in 2 Thessalonians 3 in verse 14, Paul would write, Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Now, we're talking about a brother in sin, right? Same thing. Still with me, right? Do not associate with them. Who did I lose? 
Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Yet, yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Did you hang with me all the way through that? Because part of God's rescue plan involves that time where we may have to pull back from a relationship because of a brother who persists in sin. Are we, are we willing to do that? You know, brothers and sisters, sometimes when it gets to that point, when it gets to that point, churches, churches faced resistance in the family. Some think this business of withdrawing fellowship is so unpleasant that they would just prefer that we avoid it altogether. Encourage weak people, even admonish and rebuke if we need to do that, but don't, but don't ever, ever sever the ties with them. Some are embarrassed by this business of withdrawal. Maybe you've got a guest with you this morning and you're thinking, oh boy, David's talking about that today when I have a visitor. We're embarrassed by it. Why? Because no other churches do this kind of thing. Let's be honest about that. It is rare to find any church anywhere that within the family practices discipline, even among our own brothers and sisters. The withdrawing of fellowship is increasingly becoming rare. In fact, it just makes some people angry. I mean, it just seems so unkind and not reflecting spirit, the spirit of Christ, you know, giving up on people and kicking them out of the church. You heard people say that? It all creates a dilemma. It creates a dilemma because, number one, we got this passage from the Holy Spirit. What do we do with that? And yet when churches try to follow Jesus' plan and do what he says, sometimes, sometimes it only serves to confound or compound the problem. And so you know it'll, it's, it's happening in a lot of places. Our brothers and sisters, they get caught in the clutches of the devil. Again, they get pulled back into sin. And it may be in many places, brothers and sisters, that nobody says anything. And they just gradually kind of slip away. And you look up six, eight, eight months later, they're gone. Two years later, you publish a new directory, and their name is just not included this time. That's what happens most of the time. And it's a whole lot easier to do it that way. I am not sure that it reflects the compassion, the zeal that Paul felt for his brothers and sisters. And I'm reasonably certain it's not the plan of God. And I want you to see that with me today. Maybe all this would be a lot less controversial if we would learn to see this from God's perspective. Can I give you the lesson in a nutshell today? It will really boil down to one question, and that question is this. Do we trust God? I want you to think about that today because it will underlie everything else that we say. Do we trust God? Do we believe that his way is right? It's always right. It's right when we have to do things that are hard and painful. Do we trust him? That'll be the question we'll have to answer when we get done with our study today. What I want us to do is I want us to look at some scripture that I think will paint a picture of church discipline from God's perspective and help us see it as he sees it. And maybe if we will do that, maybe if we will look at that from his perspective, maybe the picture will be more clear and church discipline will be less controversial. So to paint that picture, I want to give you five words. If you've got a little scrap in your Bible or an empty place back there on the, one of those back pages, I'd like you to write down these five words with me as we piece together the picture. The first word I want you to write down with me is this word. I want to begin with the word God. You know why I'm beginning there? Because when we talk about church discipline, brothers and sisters, we are talking about, we are talking about the plan of God. We are talking about the strategy that he has put in place for recovering his children when they wander away. You need to understand that church discipline in this family was not decided by a group of elders who got back in a room back there 40 years ago and said, this is how we think we ought to do it. 
Nobody's interested today in what men think about this. We're interested in what the Lord has to say about it. And so I want us to look at his plan. I'm beginning in Matthew 18. We'll look at several Bible passages that talk about this today. But the first one, the first one is Matthew 18. So I hope you'll go there with me in your Bible. Jesus is speaking in Matthew 18 and verse 15. He says this, if your brother sins, and I think the implication here that he has sinned against you, I think the context bears that out. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses even to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, let's just walk through this because these three verses actually actually give us four steps in God's strategy for recovering the sinner. What's step number one? You know that a brother who sinned, what he's supposed to do? Go gossip to everybody about him, because that's what verse 15 says, right? Or if he sinned against you, sit around for 30 years on the opposite side of the church building and be mad at him. That's what it says, right? What does your Bible say? If a brother sins against you, what's the command? Go. Go to him. Who else is supposed to go with you at this point? Nobody. You go. You too. You get this thing worked out. And if he listens to you, what's the language? You have won your brother. Can I just pause there and make a point? That is the goal of all church discipline. Church discipline is not an act of punishment. We're not trying to get revenge on someone, get them told, put them in their place. That is never the agenda with church discipline. Church discipline is about regaining lost disciples. Any other motive behind that? It's wicked and evil and not the plan of Jesus Christ, okay? You trying to get even with someone? That is not what Jesus is after. All church discipline is about recovering the sinner. So you know what, brother, who sins? Go to him. You two talk, you get it fixed. But now verse 16 brings up a problem, right? Because you've tried this. You've gone and talked to somebody, and it didn't go so well, right? So what does he say to do? Now it's time to gossip. You get somebody else, and you go again. I think there can be value in taking somebody else. Sometimes when you get somebody who's kind of outside the problem, and can look at it with fresh eyes. Maybe they can help. Maybe they can help bring about resolution. So Jesus says you go, you get someone else, and you talk again. But what if that doesn't work? What if he won't listen to you and he won't listen to anybody else? The third step in the process is you tell it to the church. What that, what's that about? That's about bringing to bear all of the influence of the church family. You never know who it might be that can say the thing or that has the relationship that will bring that person around. So we're going to bring the whole family to bear on this. It's not unlike what we do in this world. you got a kid who's off on drugs. You might try to talk to him. You might get some friends to try to talk to him. But, you know, sometimes families have an intervention, right? You get the whole family together and you put your foot down and say, this destructive behavior has to stop. That's similar to what's being described here. Get the family together. And you do what you can to rescue this brother. What if he won't listen to the family? Because sometimes that happens too. Sometimes you go, sometimes you take someone, sometimes the whole church appeals and he won't listen. Verse 17 says, you let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What does that mean? Does that mean we despise him now, that we hate him? Folks, we're not supposed to hate Gentiles and tax collectors. We're supposed to love them and try to win them to Jesus. What does it mean? It means you treat him like an outsider. Why would you do that? Because he is an outsider. He has left 
the family. He is no longer walking with Jesus. And what the Lord is saying is, you need to be sure that in all of your interaction with him, you communicate that things are not okay. In fact, you are in a very, very serious situation here, and I care about that, and I want that to change. Listen, let me ask you again. You have a kid on drugs. What are you willing to do? To win him back. What if you go to that kid and you talk and talk and you get others to go and the family intervenes and he won't listen to anybody? What are you going to do with that kid? I tell you what, I'm going to keep loving my kid. How about you? I'm not giving up on him. But I can tell you something else, brothers and sisters. Nothing will be right in the Banning house as long as that kid's using drugs. That relationship isn't going to be the same, and I am going to be working to turn that kid away from the destructive behavior with everything I can do. Nothing's going to be right till we get that problem fixed. Why? Because that's a big deal, right? We need to get him straightened out. So sin is worse than drugs. How seriously should we take that? And how concerned should we be with recovery? It's not the only time the Bible talks about this in Matthew 18. I'm headed over to 1 Corinthians 5. I hope you'll go there too. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This congregation had a terrible problem with sin. Just just gross immorality described in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1. And Paul is writing to them because he's terribly disappointed that they have done nothing to address the problem. Do you see the point? Something, when a brother's in sin, something is supposed to be done. You don't just ignore it and let it go on. In fact, he's pretty clear about what was supposed to happen. Verse 2, you have become arrogant and have not mourned and said so that the one who has done this deed, do you see it? Are you looking in your Bible? Would be removed from your midst. Do you see that? He's not done. He will use an illustration of leaven down in verse 7, and he will say, clean out the old leaven. And then in verse 9, he will say, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. And then verse 11, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person. And then verse 13, but those who are outside, God judges, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. What's he talking about? The same thing we were talking about in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 14. Do not associate with them. Treat him as a Gentile and a tax collector, an outsider. Why are they supposed to do that? What is the point? If you back up in chapter 5, he gives us two reasons. In verses 6 and 7, He talks about the danger of leaven infecting the whole, and his point there was you got to deal with the sinner because if you don't, he can infect and hurt the whole group. But I want you to back up to verse 5 because he says something else there. He says, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved. In the day of the Lord Jesus. What did we say about this at the beginning? The objective of all discipline is to rescue the wayward. Are we together on that? Y'all see that? One more text. I'm headed to the text on the slide. Second Corinthians. Look at Second Corinthians. I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians, rather. Second Thessalonians chapter three. Look down at verse six. This is 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you've received for us. And then again, in verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him. Why? Because, man, we want to punish that guy. We want to kick him out of the church. That's the point, right? No, no, no. Verse 14 says, so that he will be put to shame. Yeah, I know in our culture, shame is a bad thing. It isn't a bad thing to the Lord. 
point of shame is to bring someone to repentance, to turn them from their sin. I want you to see, folks, that church discipline, that strategy comes from God. Do you see that? We've looked at three Bible passages where God lays out his plan, including that place we might get where we have to, where we have to pull back from relationships. Now, you know what I hear people say about that sometimes? Sometimes what I hear people say is, well, the problem, David, is that just doesn't work. It just doesn't do any good. It just makes people mad and drives them further away. Well, okay, so first of all, biblically, that's wrong. That man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, by the time we get to 2 Corinthians, that man has been recovered. Secondly, let me ask you the question I began with. Do we trust God or not? Either this is his plan or it's not, folks. You've got to reach, read the Bible to come to your conclusion about that. I think this is what God tells us to do. And if it's what God tells us to do, a God who loves his children, then what do we know? We know that it is the right thing. That's where I want to begin, that this is God's plan. And then add to this, secondly, this is important, write this word down, that this plan involves a process. Have you seen that so far this morning? That there is a process. I'm not sure we always perceive that. Because sometimes if we're following the strategy God gives, it may be that the vast majority of our church family doesn't even know someone's having a problem until we get to this step that we have to withdraw fellowship. And frankly, that's the way it ought to be. If I know Wesley's in sin, he's not. This is an illustration, okay? If I know Wesley's in sin and I go talk to him and we get it fixed, who knows about that? Me and Wesley know. And if I can't reach him, but maybe David and David, man, how many Davids do we have in this church? If David and David go with it, the three of us persuade Wesley, how many of us know about that? Four, because he knows about it too. You see? It may be that there's a process at work here that I'm not even aware of until that time comes when the whole family has to be involved. Do you see that? Listen, those first two steps that Jesus describes in Matthew 18, please don't get the idea that that's just two quick meetings that you squeeze in in one week. Talking to wayward disciples is way more complicated than that. Do you understand? First of all, most wayward disciples know that they're wayward. And so when Wesley's number pops up on the phone, guess what they do? What do they do, Wesley? Don't answer, right? Send that text. No, I know why he's calling me, right? Send that text. No, we're saying, you send me a text? I didn't see that. See, sometimes we lie too, adding insult to injury, right? So even getting a meeting is tough. You get in a meeting, you try to talk. You got to wade through this sin problem and show some scripture, warn about that. Listen, that may take, that may take several studies to get all that kind of stuff laid out. It's a process. Far more than just being two quick, impulsive meetings, it may take a long time to work through all of that. And brothers and sisters, we may not know that any of that is even going on. Let me give you a guarantee. In a church family of this size, someone's in the process all the time. We just need to know. That it's a process. And then while I'm saying that, I'm going to add this third word. It's a difficult process. And I say it's difficult because it's a process that often involves difficult judgments. I mean, God gives us the strategy, but then along the way as it's being implemented, there are all kinds of, of judgment calls that have to be made. How many times do you appeal to someone? How many times? And when you go and talk, how much time do you give them to respond to the appeal? And then what about this guy? What about the guy you go and talk to and he says, he says, I'm going to do better. And then he doesn't. And so you go again and he said, you're right. I feel terrible. I should have done better last time. I'm going to do better now. And then he doesn't. How many times do you do that? How much patience is extended. Difficult judgment calls will have to be made. 
I want you to think about that and then ponder this passage over in Hebrews chapter 13. I'm in Hebrews 13 and verse 17. I want you to notice what the Hebrew writer says. He says, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. And then he says, let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Remember, folks, the objective of discipline is recovery. We're trying to get people back. It's like you discipline your kid on drugs to get him off drugs. We discipline church family members who are off into sin to get them out of sin. That's the objective. We want our shepherds doing this. This is for our good. And they need our support and encouragement as they make these tough judgment calls not being questioned and doubted and criticized because it is a difficult process. And then I'm going to add this. This one's going to knock your socks off. You weren't expecting this one. But, but this process of discipline is an amazing expression of love. Someone says, it is not, I don't buy that, I don't believe that for one minute. It's kicking people out of the church, it's giving up on people. First of all, let's say something about kicking folks out of the church, okay? Brothers and sisters, that is such a misrepresentation of what's happened. You understand that the guy who's gone off into sin is already gone. When the church takes action about that, what we're doing is acknowledging where he is, not putting him anywhere. And I think it takes tremendous love to do that. I challenge the idea that it's unloving. You know it's unloving? You know it's easier? Let people go. Let people go and don't say anything. Let people go and don't have to have those awkward, tough conversations, those meetings that are difficult to set up, that are painful to engage in, that are sometimes angry and hard. Just don't have them. Don't have any unpleasant announcements to the family that we're having to pull back because this brother or this sister persists in their sins. Just don't ever do it. Just, just let them go. That's easier. And it isn't love because we're not doing everything we can to rescue. You know what's a lot tougher? To pay attention. To know when one of our lambs is missing or when something's wrong with them. You know what's tougher? To go have that conversation, that difficult, unpleasant conversation when you know something is wrong. You know what's tough? It's tough to tell someone the truth that's doing the wrong thing and to appeal again and again and again, even when you may get an angry and unpleasant response, to go back and make another appeal. You know what's tough? To have someone promise you they're going to do better, and then they don't and your heart's broken, and you go back and make another appeal, and they promise, and then they don't, and your heart's broken again, and then that awful Sunday where someone's got to get up and announce, we're pulling back from our relationship because they won't turn from their sin. I'm going to tell you what, brothers and sisters, I haven't just been in the room. There was a time when I was a shepherd of this church, and I had to be involved in making those decisions, and they are painful difficult decisions. They are an expression of how much we love someone and how much we trust God that this is his plan for rescue and that's why we do it. It is a profound expression of our love for each other. And you all know where this is going. Because we have some members of our spiritual family who've come to that place. Brothers and sisters to whom appeals have been made again and again and again. And they will not listen. And they will not turn from Jesus, to Jesus.
And so we're left with no alternative but to exercise that part of Jesus' plan that gives us the best hope for bringing them back. I've been doing a research project where I've interviewed people who grew up among us and then for a while drifted away and then found their way back. One of the questions I ask in my research is, did anybody reach out to you? And I had this one lady write to me and tell me that while she was gone for several years, she said every week there was this elderly lady in the church that would call her, not to fuss, not to call her out. She would just call and tell me that she missed me on Sunday, every week for several years, and how that touched her and ultimately helped to pave the way for the road, the road for her to come back. And so I want you to look at verse number 15. Do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as a fellow believer. And I'll add this word to our list, the last word. This is not the final step in the process. The process of recovery does not end until we aren't here or they aren't here or the Lord Jesus comes. As long as that hasn't happened, we are still in recovery mode. So I want you to think about somebody that we have lost. Maybe on that list just read to us by Brother Buckley. Maybe someone we've lost in the past that needs to be rescued. How about making them your project? In two weeks, our groups will begin meeting. I told you at the beginning of the month we're forming up new groups. Two groups will meet every Sunday night. And you're going to get two lists when you meet with that group, a list of people who visited that Sunday. And you'll get a list of four or five or six people who've wandered away and who need to be rescued. Will you make somebody your project? Because we want to fulfill that obligation. These are not our enemies. These are our beloved brothers and sisters who need rescue. So we need you to go to these group meetings and we need you to be a part of the recovery effort because of all the things we do on this earth, nothing is more important as Brother Buckley has already described than helping people get to heaven. And we need every family member part of that process. Will you help us? Will you be part of that? Because, brothers and sisters, there's just not anything that's more important than being right with God. And so Ryan's going to lead us in a song, and it may be that there's someone in this crowd right now today that knows things are not right with you and God. We have an invitation every time we get together because we know that possibility is real. And we don't want to leave today without an opportunity for you to get things squared away with God. There's just nothing more important than that. So if you need to become a Christian, or if you've already done that a long time ago, but you've wandered off, you've been gone, and maybe nobody knows it but you, this family is willing and ready to help you to come back, restore that relationship. Will you let us do that? Will you let God do that? You need to respond to him. You make your way to the front. Come right now while we stand, while we sing.